Hey everyone, Grant here with ProductionCrate.com with another awesome tutorial. This week we're looking at improving your explosions in After Effects. Well, let's get started. So here we are in After Effects CC 2017. And the first thing that we're going to do is create a new comp. I'll just title this Explosion 2. Next, we'll grab some assets used for the shot. And if I head over to productioncrate.com, you can see there are a couple new assets that actually work in tandem together. These are called comp ins, and they're two separate renders of front and back or front and full for simulations. This allows you to place an object or subject within a simulation without having to roto or even mask. It's a great shortcut, and today we're going to use the comp in Sand Shockwave Front 2 under the Dust and Smoke as well as the comp in for sand shockwave back to. You've got the front angle of the effect and you've got the back angle of the effect, essentially splitting it right in half. This will be important when it comes to layering our effects later. So let's drop those in and we'll bring down our background plate. And our simple explosion 28 from footagecrate.com. And we're going to place this explosion asset right around the middle of the scene. We'll rescale it a little bit and move it to where it looks good. Next, we'll bring in our scorch marks. And so these are essentially the marks that are going to be left behind from the explosion. I just want to grab the pan behind tool and bring the anchor point all the way down. And we're going to make that a 3D layer and take our X rotation and take it right down to negative 90. We'll put this underneath the explosion asset. You can see how it animates in when I solo the layer like this. So now that we've got that underneath our explosion, it's worth noting that it's important to get the timing right of both the explosion and the scorch marks, as well as the rest of the elements that we drag down into this. So now if we take the back of our shockwave comp in and we put it below those other elements, it's going to come in and look as though it's actually behind the explosion. This is perfect because now we don't have to try and cut that effect in half or try to rotoscope on an angle or anything like that. We can turn on our front shockwave and just like that we've got the shockwave split in half with the explosion happening right in the middle. This is how you can tell these comp ins are going to save you a lot of time and get great results. So next we're going to bring in our explosion sweeteners. So these are essentially sparks and flares and little things like that that might happen in an explosion. And so I'm going to drop them all. I'm going to drop all three of them in and we're just going to go ahead and line them up. For my taste, I say let's if you're going to go with an explosion, go big or go home. So we're going to put all three sweeteners right in the middle of where that explosion goes off. So next we'll just line up the timing of them. We'll put We'll trim the front of each layer and line all those up for the beginning of our animation. So let's just see where those come in. Let's take our layers and just move them a bit to the right and um, start from a clean empty background as though no explosion is about to begin. Next we're going to take each of those sweeteners and change their layer mode to add. And the reason I like changing all of these to add is because these are usually the brightest and hottest spots in the scene. So if these sparks are flying, there's almost no way a camera recording them in real life would actually get the exposure properly. So they almost always blow out. It not only looks more real to life, but it also feels hotter, it feels brighter, it really feels like there's more velocity there. The last asset that we're going to bring in is a smoke shock wave, and this is from Footage Crate as well. So we're going to start by putting it as the lowest layer in our stack, and we're going to move it and readjust the size to make it fit where it needs to. I'm going to hit S to bring up the scale, and then before we go ahead and shrink this um, and set another keyframe, I just want to grab the pan behind tool, and I want to bring the anchor point from the middle of the clip down to the middle of the smoke ring, so that way any resizing that we do will resize right from the center of that ring. So what we're going to do now is set a keyframe at a very small ring and as the explosion goes off you can see that it gives the animation like the smoke cloud starts at the base, starts right where the explosion starts and it grows in size and shoots out. And now we're just going to kind of tweak the front end of this. We're going to realign it, pull the head forward, and we'll actually increase the scale 
when it is fully out. There we go. Now we've got some good looking explosion going. So we've got multiple things interacting in this scene and there's not only the flames, the sparks, some initial dust and the whole smoke shockwave coming out and our timing is really now starting to come together. So I'll just go ahead and tweak this front end just a little bit more to get the timing right. Now just to organize a little better, let's take our sweeteners and we'll make their label purple and we'll go ahead and take our front and back comp in shockwave and we'll just make that blue just so things are a little bit easier to visualize here. And we'll just lock our background plate just to make sure we don't accidentally mess with that. Okay, so things are looking pretty good, um, but the biggest thing that we're missing now is a little bit of color correction. We're gonna go ahead and type in our effects and presets tritone, and we'll drag that on the smoke shockwave. And as you can see, it comes in in a brown appearance. We'll just uh, simply color pick something in the scene, something bluish, and we'll change the highlights a little too, but don't allow those to go too dark. We're gonna raise the brightness back up. Next, we'll go to our shadows and just make sure they're dark as well. Now we can mess with the blending of the effect too. So we'll put it down to 34% just for now. And we'll play that back a couple times and get a feel for, does this color look like the type of dust and debris that would shoot out from this floor? So I'm just gonna take the shadows a little darker. And we'll make our midtones just a little bit lighter. I'm just trying to fine tune this, I feel like the dust isn't going to be bright white and it also can't be dark. So we don't wanna mistake it as actual smoke. We're just using this element for dust. Now, if we work on our comp in effects, our sand shock waves, the front and back, these are gonna be a little bit more interesting to color crack. We're gonna use the levels effect. We're gonna apply that and go to the red channel and we'll just take the red output white down a little bit. Now it's starting to turn a little bit green here, so we're gonna come into our green channel and take that green output white down as well. Now I'm just gonna take the blue input white and just bring it in a slight touch. Now we can toggle this on and off to see what we've done. And we can drop this down and go back to the RGB channels. We're simply gonna take, let me just play with this a little bit. So before I do any more tweaking with this levels effect, I just wanna bring all the layers back on so I can see how this is appearing when it's mixed in with everything else. So we'll turn them all back on and we'll just see how this looks. So right now I'm thinking it looks a little too bright. Just take the mid-tones on this levels effect. We're gonna take that down a touch and then as a result, we're gonna to have to come into our red channel and take the red output white down a touch. Now we're getting a little bit closer. So we'll copy that effect and paste it on the back. And it definitely is a contrast in comparison to the dust layer that we started with earlier. So I'm just gonna go back in and do a little bit more tweaking. I'm gonna take the green channels down, then I'll take the red down just a little bit. And I'll take my overall output white down. So making this all a touch darker. We'll copy that effect and paste it to, whoops, not paste it to that. We'll paste it to the back of this shockwave. And let's just play that back a few times and get a feel for it. There, now I'm a little bit happier with this because what I didn't want is for it to really stand out. Um, now it blends in a little bit more and it's not gonna be the first thing that draws your eyes. So next, we're gonna color correct the explosion itself. So let's grab our levels effect and drop it on that layer. And now I'm gonna zoom in and just take a look at what the background image shows in its darkest blacks versus what this explosion shows. So the explosion is properly white balanced. The background plate is not. The background is definitely blue. However, you might find yourself in a scenario where that's exactly what the director wanted. They wanted this blue cool take. So as we've been matching our assets to this blue style, we also have to match the smoke and the fire itself. Starting with levels, we're gonna go ahead and we'll take in the blue input white, just a touch, and we'll take the blue output black, 
also in just a touch. Now we can go into our red and we'll do our red input black, bring that in a touch, and already with maybe six clicks, we've already got that smoke looking pretty much where it needs to be. But before we move on, let's actually just take the contrast of this and try to match it a little bit closer to the scene. So we'll go into our RGB and take the input black down, and that's essentially the feeling of crushing the blacks, and we'll bring our input white in just a touch as well. So let's take a look and see how our effects have messed with the color of the flames. So they still look bright and gold and red, um, which to me actually kind of stands out a little bit in this scene. We're going to go into the red channel, and we're going to take the red output white and bring that in quite a bit. Nah, I'm not liking that. So let's actually go to the blue channel and let's try crushing the blue input white. So by adding a little bit more blue into the whites, I think that's enough to take this explosion to where it needs to be. We'll take one last look at the colors in our sequence and make sure nothing stands out to us. All right, so that looks pretty good, but to top it all off, we're gonna go ahead and create a glow layer. So we'll make our adjustment layer, we'll bring it to the top of our stack, we'll go into effects, grab our glow, and with the eyedropper for color A, we're gonna simply select one of the yellow shades and let's actually just push that a little bit more towards orange. And for color B, we'll just pick from that. Now, very important, in your glow colors effect, we're gonna take the glow colors and toggle that down to our A and B colors, as opposed to original colors. So if I toggle this back and forth, you can see if we just glow the original colors, you're gonna get some blue glows, some cyan glows, but that's obviously not what we're going for. What we want is the fire to feel like it's glowing off of these bright spots in the scene. So now that we've got that set, let's take our glow intensity, we'll crank it up a little bit. We're gonna take our glow radius all the way up to something like 94 and we're gonna take our glow threshold down to 36 and a half. Um, you don't have to be perfect with these numbers, of course. And now our scene is really glowing. It looks crazy. So if we play this back, we can see how the glow pretty much affects everything that's bright in the scene. Now what we want to do is take our pen tool and isolate areas in the scene that we don't think this explosion would necessarily hit from that distance. So for instance, a lot of the ceiling and these windows they're picking up the glow because they've got bright spots naturally in the picture. And the distance from the explosion to the ceiling in the back is a little too far in my opinion. So we're gonna create a mask and set it to subtract and this is gonna take away from that adjustment layer. Now we'll go ahead and create a quick mask around a window and we'll do some other masks around here where it just doesn't seem feasible that this explosion should be adding a glow to. We'll turn those both to subtract. We'll take our feathering and we're just gonna feather all these out a bit. We'll go a little lighter on that window, but the rest we can get right up to like 200, 250. And now that I'm looking at it, I think we should take this front piece out too, or at least feather it, maybe like cut it in half. So we're gonna subtract that, get it up to about 250. And we'll just kind of tweak where it's at. Now you may be saying to yourself, this still looks a bit unrealistic. That's okay. We're gonna change the mode for this layer to add. So just like our sweeteners, the add brightens this and almost takes everything to a blown out stage. And now we can work on when and how long this glow takes place. So we'll hit T to bring down our opacity on our layer and we'll set a keyframe by hitting the stopwatch. Now we'll simply line up the timing of our glow to the timing of the explosion. We'll set another keyframe at 100% just a little bit later so this glow can last for a little bit. And then we'll go back and set a keyframe at zero right before the explosion happens. We can kind of scrub through it and see it appears as though our explosion is the cause of this bright glow that's happening in the scene. So if we go near the end of the explosion, we can take our opacity all the way down to zero and set a keyframe there. And I'm gonna take that keyframe and by right clicking it or open Apple clicking and hit keyframe assistant, we'll go to easy ease in. And so that will just allow the glow to kind of ease its way out of the scene. Now we can just scrub that back a couple times and get a feel for how it's looking. Let's take that last keyframe and slide it to the right a little bit more. I think this glow should last a little bit longer. And now if we play it through a few times. So the only thing I'm not feeling too great about 
is our shock wave that's at the bottom. If this explosion was happening in real life and that dust flew out like a dust cloud, I don't think it would be dark blue when everything else is being overexposed. We'll take our blending up to like 50%, which actually kills the tritone effect slightly. And let's take it all the way to 58. That's gonna allow us to blend it more. It basically allows the effect to go back towards white instead of blue, and thus the glow affects it a little bit more. So now I'm just gonna slightly tweak our masks here. I would love if this glow did a little bit more near the top of the frame. And if we zoom in on this little brick area, we can see that this type of glow effect works perfect with explosions and really gives the feel that there's proximity here and the closest spots to the explosion are actually being affected the most by light. So I'm just gonna tweak this a little bit more. We'll take that keyframe that I slid out and take it down about 75. So now that I'm feeling pretty good about all the blending and the overall look of this, let's add one more element. We're gonna highlight all of our layers, go up to layer and pre-compose. And I'll just call this explosion pre-comp one. We'll extend our work area out and we will take a look at how this looks. Everything looks pretty great. We're gonna hit A to bring up our anchor point. Alt click on the stopwatch. And as an expression, we're gonna type in wiggle parenthesis one comma five close parenthesis. Now what this is going to do is actually add a little bit of shake to our scene. So let me blow that up to 50 instead of one and you can see how the, sh the scene really shakes. We don't quite wanna give it the full on explosion shake right now. We're just gonna go with something that feels kind of like a simple handheld camera. So there's a little bit of movement. It doesn't feel so static like it's just a picture, but we're gonna give it that slight wiggle just so it kind of feels free form, a little handheld. So next we're gonna go up to our effects and presets and find the wiggler effect. And so after applying that, you can see our footage goes wonky. Don't worry, that's okay. We're gonna go in and change some of these parameters. We'll take the wiggle scale down. We'll take the wiggle rotation down. We're only gonna worry about the positioning of this. So first, we're gonna come down to our timeline and see when the explosion first takes place. We're gonna set keyframes for those top three values. So now we'll go back to before the explosion happens and we're gonna set all those back down to zero, except wiggle nervousness that can stay at one. And now we'll move to where the explosion is done taking its toll on the scene. Right there, we're gonna set our keyframes right back down to zero again. So technically, the wiggle nervousness parameter isn't required to be adjusted in this effect. Now what we're doing is we're creating a giant camera shake right when that explosion goes off. This adds some velocity, adds some motion, and some feel to the camera itself. We're gonna crank that peak wiggle up, we're gonna crank that wiggle positioning up, the nervousness up, and especially the wiggle speed. So those parameters you can crank up to your liking and don't forget to enable motion blur. However, the one thing that you may be noticing is by shaking the camera, we're actually cutting off parts of the image. No worries, let's go to our effects and presets and we'll type in motion for the motion tile effect and we will change the output width and height to something over 200 and select mirror edges. We'll drag that to the top of the effect stack and now you can see when we toggle it on and off, the effect actually tells part of the picture to mirror itself if it ever goes off screen. So there we have it. We can watch this back a couple of times and Hopefully you learned some things about compositing in terms of timing, glow, color correction, as well as the assets that are on productioncrate.com, especially those compens, which could make your life much, much easier. So once again, for productioncrate.com, I'm Grant. Have a nice day.